Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough, and we're exploring the wonderful region of the Cotswolds in southwest England. We've decided to revisit the centre of the region and find some hidden gems, places that are not quite so famous, but still just as beautiful. And today you find Ross and me without our trusty companions, our furry companions, uh, because it's so hot and beautiful this summer's day, it's just really not right to take dogs in a car. So I've left them behind, I'm afraid, today. But you find us in a beautiful village called Todnam. Now, it was a recommendation that we come here from Diana in Northamptonshire, which I'm grateful to you, Diana, very grateful indeed for introducing us to this place. It's a beautiful village and we're gonna show you around. The church at the moment is not open, sadly, and it's an interesting part of the story of this village is that some of it doesn't appear to be quite as successful as you might have thought. We're going to show you around. Come with me. I suppose the first impression of this little village was a little less than auspicious. It's true it looked well groomed, the houses are looked after, but everything seemed just a little too deserted. And the two crucial buildings at the top of the main drag, the pub and the church, standing next to one another in what felt like mutual despair, were closed up and apparently unloved and decaying. It's odd, this thing of first impressions. It's very easy to make assumptions that can turn out to be entirely wrong. However, I don't think it unreasonable to be concerned when these two crucial elements of a community appear to be so ignored. Of course, we arrived here, having found out quite a lot about the great history of this place, but we had absolutely no insight into the 21st century goings-on in the village. It didn't take us long to find out a bit more. Tottenham is first mentioned in a charter dated 804 AD, when it was part of the Kingdom of Mercia. It seems Ethelric bequeathed the village of Tottenham to Deerhurst Abbey in return for being buried here. He certainly had a good eye for a heavenly place to lay to rest. It remained in the hands of Deerhurst for around 200 years. In the late 10th century, Deerhurst Abbey's assets were seized by a local warlord who passed it on to his relative, King Edward the Confessor. In 1065, the dying king granted Tottenham to the institution closest to his heart, Westminster Abbey. And they held it for over 460 years. At the dissolution, it passed inevitably into the hands of the crown and was gifted to one of Thomas Cromwell's most trusted lieutenants, Sir William Petrie. And whilst it seems neither he nor any of his descendants ever visited the place, they owned it for over 250 years. In 1783, they sold it to the Derbyshire family of Pole, descendants of the last Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury. They and their descendants owned the manor until the middle of the 20th century, at which point the estate was divided up and sold. The enclosures of the 16th century had altered the makeup of the settlement considerably as they did so many of the communities in this region. And during the second phase of enclosure in the 18th century, the village started to look more like what we see today. It almost feels like two separate villages. So along come Ross and me to visit this place with such a distinguished history and we do what we always tend to do, which is to head for the church. You could easily say that you only do that because it's easy to find, and you would be partially right. Churches do stand out, and they normally sit somewhere close to the heart of the village. In this case, it sits at the end of the village, but clearly it has always been treated as the centre of the community. The pub, the Farrier's Arms, is right next to the church, and the section of the village is known as Church End. 
The most obviously noticeable thing is that the very ancient pub building, whilst it has a long and interesting history of its own, is in a state of desperate decay and clearly hasn't operated as a hostelry for quite a while. This kind of sight always upsets me. Obviously, there could be all kinds of reasons for this state of affairs, but as usual, I jump to the conclusion that someone, probably a pub company, is holding out for permission to turn the building into a house, for which they'd get a lot more money than selling it as a pub. This kind of thing is happening all over the Cotswolds, and it has the potential to destroy communities. Just as I was composing in my mind a tirade about the curse of the pubcos, we were greeted by the friendly opposite neighbours, who came out of their home and told us that the building belonged to a real person, who hadn't managed to make the pub work himself, but was trying extremely hard to sell it as a potential business. Well, I got that wrong then. We wish him the very best of luck. Just at that moment, however, Ross came back to tell me that the church was locked. This was a bit of a blow, so I followed him up the path to the church door, where fortunately we found a very friendly notice on the wall of the porch telling us where to go to find a key. Things were looking up again. The church, dedicated to St Thomas a Becket, is well worth the trouble to gain access. It was almost entirely rebuilt in the 14th century, of local stone with a Welsh slate roof. This is a bit of a rarity in the Cotswolds. The tower of Ashlar stone has two stages with diagonal buttresses, and the spire is octagonal with unusual solid pinnacles at the corners. In 1768, the spire was so severely damaged in a storm it had to be completely rebuilt about four years later. The eastern window is beautiful with some excellent stained glass made in 1879 by Lavers, Barrow and Westlake. There is a plain but seemly pulpit of no great importance, but there is an early 19th century royal arms, altered at a later date to include the VR monogram. Looking up, there is a beautiful medieval trust roof to the chancel. The font is 13th century, with a circular bowl, with a rather later pedestal, and it was restored to the church by the church wardens in 1773. They celebrated this achievement by having their names engraved in the stone. Some might say a little OTT and possibly even vandalism, but surely signs of an unwelcome vanity. There are various memorials to the Pole family and others, including war memorials. And the church is extremely well kept and watched over, but I do get the impression that there's not a great deal of activity here. But given my record of judgment in this village, I may be completely wrong. There are a couple of rather wonderful chest tombs surrounded by wrought iron railings just outside the church porch which deserve respect and attention but are completely overgrown and inaccessible and that isn't the best of signs. We returned the keys to the delightfully kind custodian and I really should have asked him for more information but I had troubled him enough and I'm not good at pushing my luck. I'm told there's a wonderful farm shop on the local estate. Perhaps we'll visit them sometime and see what they have to offer. As a final experience with the locals, all of whom were friendly, helpful and kind, we met a man who was very pleased to see us. He has a holiday let in the village and hopes we might encourage visitors. Well, I'm very happy to oblige. Tottenham deserves a visit from anyone travelling in this area. I hope you've enjoyed our little trip around Todnam. We've really enjoyed being here. It's an extraordinarily pretty place. And I think on second thoughts, it's a buzzing little village. We've met more locals than normal and they've been extremely friendly and helpful. 
we've enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You can find us on all the normal platforms. We'll be back in the Cotswolds in the very near future.